There's certain things in, in our church life, in our Christian walk, that if we don't emphasize, it's really easy to forget about. One of those is prayer. Another one of those is sharing, sharing the gospel. And so, Nato, as many of you know, um, he's been teaching our fifth and sixth graders uh, with Trish for quite a while, but also has a reputation of loving to share Jesus Christ. So, are they correct in assuming that you grew up in a Christian home loving Jesus, walking with him all your life? Not quite so. <laughs> so um, I, I grew up in a Catholic home, so I knew about Jesus, but I didn't really know Jesus. Right. And then, um, about how old were you when, you when you began to understand who Jesus really was? Well, I was 20. I want to say 26 years old, mm -hmm. someone challenged me because um, I thought of Jesus as just another good person, a moral teacher. And so it was, it was a neighbor who challenged me uh, and said, really? Is that all he is? And so I started looking into it. And to my chagrin at the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was finding out that he was more than just a good person. So it was, a, it was a neighbor then, was this? Yes, he was a direct neighbor. And because I essentially said, well, you know, it's kind of, you know, like Santa Claus with the reindeer. Jesus is kind of like Santa Claus, you know. <laughs> so that's what I said. And he's like, mm, okay. So uh, he pointed me to some things to look at. And I also researched on myself to see if Jesus was really who he claimed to be. And then, um, okay, so what I wanted to ask and I thought was, was, would be good for all of us to learn. Certainly, it's great to hear somebody's testimony and to see what God does. But what, what characteristics would you say of your neighbor or other people that God put in your life that really, that he used in a way that was, was helpful for you beginning to understand? Well, um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, there. no, it's okay. But, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I was... It turns out that there were other circumstances in my life. Um, I had come back to Salt Lake City. I had run away from finishing school, but then I decided to come back. And in order to do so, I had to be humbled in a way. And so God was already starting to work on me. And so it was very opportune that my neighbor was there challenging me at that right time. So it was already at work. And so uh, his he was very, he was a, very nice, kind person who was willing to talk, and he was, he was, you know, he was very gracious. And and it took longer than a conversation. Yes, right? it took quite a while. It took uh, probably about three months, I would mm -hmm. say, for me to keep researching and digging and digging. And the more I dug, the more I found out what I didn't want, which was that Jesus was indeed supernatural. So. And then, um, yeah, one of the things, Onato had the opportunity a few years ago at Men's Retreat to share his extended testimony, and if you want to ask him about it, it's, it's just really a picture of how, and all of us have our own stories about just how God works, you know, how he was working through his circumstances, put a neighbor there. Um, but one of the reasons I want him specifically to come up here is when we were emphasizing in the sharing Jesus. Here was somebody who was just willing to do the hard thing and just start a religious conversation. Sometimes we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And if you would have talked to Nato probably initially, you might have thought, well, he's not interested. Yeah. You might have thought that after the first month or the second month even, but to see that don't give up, don't, don't refrain from sharing. Yeah, and I think so. Anything else you want to say about the process of you, just in your own testimony of coming yeah. to faith or how that's... Sure. Yeah. Um, I kind of came, I wouldn't say maybe kicking and screaming, but close, close <laughs> to kicking and screaming. In other words... I wasn't really a willing, I wasn't just embracing it right off the bat, but when I, the conclusion I reached about who Jesus was, in other words, that he really performed miracles, that he's mentioned in the Old Testament, the Messiah predicted to come to the letter, to the day, all those things that I found out were not things that I wanted to know about. It wasn't something that I was excited about. So there was a little bit of a process where I was kind of gruff and not very nice or happy yeah. about what I was finding out. But it was still helpful uh, for him to engage and to keep talking. So.
And, but you're excited about them now, right? Yes, I'm very excited about them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's gracious beyond compare. Yeah. And uh, I know that I would never sacrifice my own son, Daniel, for any one of you. I wouldn't do it, sorry. <laughs> but I know that God sacrificed his son for us. So yeah. that shows me how gracious he is. So anyway. Well, thank you. And um, if you ever want to talk with Nato too, like I said, he's got a real passion for sharing Christ now as well. Um, wherever he goes, whether people are being dragged in the conversation, kicking and screaming, right? Um, but uh, just, you know, get to, and one of the things, get to know each other. Ask each other, how is it that you came to know Jesus Christ? There's some amazing stories just in a room only this big. And, and, and God is good. Um, with that in mind, we're going to talk about a church in our next series. It was kind of dragged kicking and screaming into obedience. And so uh, that we're going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians here. And today we're going to go by introduction. So the book of 2 Corinthians is, about a, is kind of the conclusion to a longer story. And we're going to talk about that longer story this morning to set, to set the background. We won't be jumping very far into this, this letter that God inspired and wrote through the Apostle Paul to instruct the church at Corinth, but also to instruct us. But we want to kind of remind you, we, we did 1 Corinthians, it was actually four years ago. I was looking through when we started, and it's almost to the month, almost to the day, and in 2013, we started 1 Corinthians. And a lot of you have perhaps been in a church or a Bible study where you've studied 1 Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians is, doesn't get as much time um, from the pulpit. And as I, we were um, talking as a staff, Chris and I, and just just different subject matter that I said, hey, I want to I want to pick your brain too. What if, where prayerfully do you think we should be going with the next um, sermon series? And then all of a sudden, it was I started realizing I don't think I've ever preached through the book of Second Corinthians. And why is that? This is a really good book, and it also gives the conclusion of the story that we started in First Corinthians. And so we're gonna we're gonna jump into this. But it was a wayward church. It was a church that was founded by the Apostle Paul. And they were born into a difficult environment. It was, Corinth was a major city, a powerful city in the Roman Empire. It was a prosperous city, sitting on the isthmus of Greece there. But it was a difficult environment. There was idolatry, there were mystery religions, there was rampant immorality, there were relig religious persecutions and false teachers all around this fledgling church. And so, it, but even in that environment, it grew and it was established. And the Apostle Paul saw great things happen in the city of Corinth, and people respond and come to Christ. And then he went off to, to plant for more churches as he was called to do. But as he was gone, and while he was gone, there was sort of a spiritual mutiny. And many people in the congregation began to defect. And the faithful were be trying to keep it on track, but they were overwhelmed and perhaps felt like they were in over their heads, and they were confused. And so Paul now is trying to correct this church and to bring them back into obedience and to bring them back into right thinking and how they should respond by living out the gospel faithfully. And so 2 Corinthians has been after a period where there's been correction by the time this letter has already come, and it's kind of on the back side of the church being corrected. It's not all the way there yet, but things are starting to look up. And we get to see, by Paul writing this very personal letter, what has transpired in this young church of the difficulties and the struggles that the apostle himself had in dealing with this church and the kind of a back and forth um, between them, between letters, between visits. And we get to see that they are now moving towards resolution and reconciliation. So this letter, written under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us a picture of the church of Corinth, of its struggle, as well as of the apostles' own sufferings. And it gives guidance for our own lives um, and, and as we face our own struggles and want to move in a direction in our own walk with the Lord that is in alignment with God and his holy character. So we're gonna, I, we're, I am excited about this, this book that we get to go through together. I hope you are as well, but let's pray and we'll jump in uh, further this morning. Lord, thank you so much. Um, we think about what Nato just shared and how really he, he said in some ways he was drug kicking and screaming into the kingdom um, just to be able to see how much you loved him. And we see this church, Lord, that was, was disobedient and confused and rebellious on so many levels. 
and yet you did not cast them off either. But through the Apostle Paul, that you, you pursued them and brought them back and loved them. And I pray, Lord, if nothing else, we'd be reminded of your faithfulness and your love. And then how none of us are too far to escape your reach, that you could draw us back into your loving embrace. And I pray with that, you would speak to us this morning and show us who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's look at this here. A uh, little background information on the, uh, on the book here of 2 Corinthians. Uh, first of all, who wrote, wrote 2 Corinthians? Well, as we've already said, that was the Apostle Paul. It was a letter to the church, part of a continuing correspondence going on between the Apostle and the church that he had founded there. And so, if we're going to look at what was going on there, he, he is continuing to write letters, which God was directing. Now, the, the great news about this is in terms of external attestation, in terms of validity, even by those who do not affirm the, um, the faith, even by scholars who are not believers, um, for both First and Second. Corinthians have never had any serious challenges to being not Pauline. They're recognized as being the legitimate works of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you do some background reading, some people, when it comes to 2 Corinthians, wonder if it's one letter or several letters put together. Um, I believe it's one letter and then a couple letters have been lost. There's clearly more than just these two letters back and forth between the Corinthian church and the Apostle Paul. But these are the ones that the Holy Spirit chose to preserve as timeless revelation for the entire church, not just for the specific situation going on in Corinth, but also for us today as well. So if you're reading, it says, well, this says this was letter number four. Well, some people do believe it was letter number four. Ultimately, what matters is that the Holy Spirit has preserved this for us. But you're going to hear me saying this is his second. When I say his second letter, it would have been his fourth letter, not um, an amalgamation of other writings. So uh, it's never been denied. It was attested by the church fathers from an early age. It was well known throughout the Mediterranean churches in the first century and following, and it's quoted um, regularly and referenced. Um, it was in the city of Corinth. I didn't put that on the screen. And just as a background, what was the city of Corinth? It was an important city connecting uh, central Greece to the north with the Peloponnesus and the south. It was built on the north side of Acrocorinth, a big old mountain hill, which you'll see. That actually, the picture here is taken from that giant hill, that mountain looking, overlooking the lower city. Um, and it was an almost impregnable fortress. It was a military stronghold guarding this important... Um, it wasn't a canal yet. Today, there's a Corinthian canal, but the overland route by a trade. It was a trade route. And it was rich and prosperous, but also known for its immorality in ancient Corinth. First destroyed by the Romans in, in 146 BC, the Romans later rebuilt it as a Roman colony, and it became a capital of the Roman pro province of Achaia. And its population was over 200,000, which may not sound like a lot today, but back then this was a major metropolitan center. So when you spoke of Corinth, it would have been one of the largest cities in the region, and it would have been known by name. It was influential and had a very diverse populace. Um, it was written about 57 AD from Macedonia, possibly there from Philippi. Uh, as Paul is writing this letter as part of his correspondence, we'll touch on that in a second. And really, it's a defense of Paul's ministry. See, when Paul left, you know, there's that thing when, when there's a vacuum in leadership, what can happen? People step into that vacuum, and sometimes not the right people. So as Paul has gone away, in a very similar manner as he later warned the Ephesian church and said, in my absence, you know, savage beasts will rush in, not sparing the flock. And this is essentially what happened in Corinth. Once Paul left, even though he left behind good people, false teachers began to creep in. Other people began to push the limits on decent behavior um, that was, a, was not appropriate for those who claimed the name of Jesus Christ. And in that, because they didn't other people trying to assert their own authority, they had to try and undercut Paul's authority. So they were trying to say, well, he's not really a full apostle. He doesn't really have the complete message. You need to listen to us because we've got the whole story over here and trying to assert their own influence on the church. And so part of what Paul is writing here is a defense of his own ministry. He lays out his resume. Something that you can even see in his writing is he's writing a very letter. It's not as systematic as like a treatise or a treaty or a formal paper that you would write for school. It's like, I'm not going to boast, I'm not going to boast, I'm not going to give you my credentials. Okay, fine, I am. 
And then he just lays them all out to say, look, I'm going to defend my ministry because it was given to me directly by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He appeared to me and set forth to me, called me as an apostle. And he lays forth his his defense. But what we also see in this, and something that we need to have a better theology of in our culture that we don't, is it shows the glory of God revealed through our struggle and through our suffering. It doesn't mean we like struggle and suffering, but the truth is all of us have it. And that does not negate the promises of God, and it does not hinder his ministry, but rather God can be and often is glorified through our struggles for his own namesake. There's some insights about Bob Utley, um, scholar Bob Utley, about this letter. He says, This book, more than any other letter of Paul, shows us the heart and mind of the apostles to the Gentiles. It is the closest we have to his spiritual and pastoral autobiography. He says that this book is truly a letter, and it's only one half of a conversation. It is a good example that the epistles of the New Testament were originally written as a correspondence to specific needs, and they were not independent theological dissertations. And then he says, for pastors or leaders, this book offers insightful guidelines on how to deal with problems within local churches. Paul gives us an example to follow amidst personal attacks and misunderstandings. So it's going to be a very practical book, but it's also going to be something that probably applies to all of us, because if you've ever suffered... And if you've ever struggled, then we're going to have some points of contact with the Apostle Paul. If you've ever been in a church that was not perfect, and by the way, you're there this morning, so all of us qualify, um, then this this book should have some insight for us today in the 21st century. But what I wanted to cover here um, before we moved on is a little bit of how we got to this point. Some of this we're going to repeat now as we go through the letter of 2 Corinthians. You'll get these, these statements by inference and by, by direct point as Paul is reminding the church of the relationship that they have had up to this point. But we're going to say it all up front so l- later when he just drops these little statements that would be really well known to people who live them, we'll have a, a, better, a better outline to hang those on. But before we read that, the first two books, the first two verses in the book of 2 Corinthians say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is in Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, here is my letter to the church of God in Corinth. I'm writing with Timothy. Timothy was his co-laborer, kind of like his associate pastor. It says, grace and peace to you. And be written in a a situation where you may not be feeling a lot of grace and peace if you had walked it, but we really get to see Paul's character. We've gone through a conflict, but I am wishing you grace, and I'm wishing you peace. Well, Corinth is right here in what is today modern Greece, and you can see it up there. We'll blow this up a little bit. Right there on the isthmus, that, that little neck uh, connecting the two pieces of Greece and the trade route. They would just cross over instead of sailing around the bottom. You may say, why would they go over land when they could sail around really easily? It's because back then it wasn't a very easy voyage, especially with the stormy seas, different times of year. It was quite dangerous to take your goods around the southern tip of Greece, and this would be the safe route to make sure that your goods got to go where they were going. And then he... Um, he starts to have this correspondence back and forth. It was, it was started, of course, with the founding of the church of Corinth, which we see in Acts chapter 18. And he came in and the Holy Spirit miraculously, providentially set aside a period of a year and a half where Paul ministered in the city and was protected. If you read the book of Acts, you read, Paul went from a city and it normally went like this. Paul preached the gospel. Some believed, some rejected. Those who rejected him beat him, threw him out of town, and he went to the next city. And then you go, and repeat. The the guy got hit more times than a pinata. I mean, it was not a very uplifting ministry from time to time. But when he got to Corinth, God said to him, you are safe here. In the city where it may be unlikely for you to feel safe, with all this pagan idolatry, with all these mystery religions, with everything going on, you will be safe here for a year and a half. 
And you will get to proclaim the gospel. And the church was founded and established and began to grow. And then Paul had other responsibilities, calling him back to Jerusalem. And so he left, and he left people there with the church. And after he went to Jerusalem, he went to the city of Ephesus because he met some people there who needed to know Jesus Christ. And if you look up there on the screen, it's on the far right bottom corner of the map, another major city in the Roman Empire to start a church. And he wrote a letter back to Corinth. And this is what we would call the lost letter. It seems to be like, hey, how are things going? Is our best guess of the letter. And then he finds out things aren't going so well. Um, so he, he found, the church was founded probably in about, the, in 50, about 50 um, A.D. And he's writing this letter a little bit later, probably about 52. So two years after the church has been there, probably even gone not that long, he gets some correspondence back and it says, Things aren't good, and we have a lot of questions. And he writes the letter of 1 Corinthians. And we did 1 Corinthians, and you've probably gone through 1 Corinthians if you've been in a church. It's a really practical book because it's like question-answer format. Once you figure out how it is, the church will say, what about this? And then Paul will answer, and he writes it in the context of this letter. And even though we only read the responses and not the fully developed questions, it's very practical because the issues the Corinthians were facing back then are similar to the issues we're dealing with today. And he gives... Instruction on spiritual gifts, on leadership, on, on love, and so many other details Just we just read out of the book about the Lord's table. That was from 1 Corinthians. He's instructing them on their questions, on their problems, to correct them. But it doesn't go so well. He doesn't understand that they are not responding in kind. So then what he does is he takes a trip to Corinth, wanting to stay with them, wanting to give them more instruction. And then what we read is it was called a painful visit. But he goes anticipating it to be a good experience going back to his church after having just written them a letter of instructing them how now to properly deal with these questions turns into a blow-up. We don't know exactly what happened, but he says it was a painful visit and he was humiliated by some of the people in the church who would not listen to him and denigrated him and publicly mocked him and he left early. And you think about it. This is the Apostle Paul. Out of the people we put on a pedestal in the Bible, he's pretty high up there. And he's struggling with this young church. So he goes back, and then he writes what he calls his, what was called his angry letter, or he calls his severe letter. We do not have his severe letter. We don't have the first, we don't have the third. And later on in this book, he'll say, I, I'm almost sorry that I wrote it. I was very harsh with you. Because he, he went back, Collected himself and then just let them have it and saying, you are so out of line. You're out of line. But after he wrote it, because he cares about these people, he began to grieve. What if I've wounded them? What if I've injured them? What if I've destroyed the relationship? And he wants to know how they're doing. And Titus, his, his other co-worker, has gone to Corinth to help instruct the people, to help mediate the situation and say, you guys are very far out of line. And Paul wants to meet with Titus and saying, can I come see them yet? Is it a good time? Have we been reconciled? And so he travels up to Troas, and he's supposed to meet Titus there, but Titus isn't there. So after he meets with the other believers in Troas, he says, i got to go to Macedonia, and i got to start making my way to Corinth. And he um, is connected there with, um, with Titus probably in Philippi initially, and he stops, and he hears they're responding. It took them a little bit of time to get their heads straight, but they're beginning to submit to the authority of God. They're beginning to put their thoughts and their actions in accordance with God's word. And so before he goes, he writes um, what we know is the letter of 2 Corinthians, and that is sent down. And this will be followed up, which is post-letter, um, by a visit, and we know then he stayed in Corinth for some time, and in fact, it's in the city of Corinth that he writes the book of Romans. See? So why all this background? Because it's a mess. It's a mess, isn't it? You just be like, I didn't even follow you, and I just know that apparently they're having some big old fight. The Apostle Paul in this church, this church was being rebellious, this church was being sinful, this church was doing, just drifting in all sorts of wrong directions. There was a mutiny afoot. And Paul went in not realizing how pronounced perhaps it was, and it turned into a little bit of a bloodletting. 
But then we see that the church responds and God's work begins to bring the church back and to reconcile Paul to his congregation. And it is reestablished um, as, as a faithful congregation where he can once again have a base. And this brings us to just some principles we're going we're gonna to hit in, in this series that I, I hope you realize that relates to where I'm at. Certainly all scripture is profitable, okay? And so even if you said, I don't relate to it, it would still be profitable because what I've learned in my life is some of the lessons I read about in the Bible and say, you know what, that has nothing to do with me, but it's God's word, so I better learn it, have turned out to be profitable down the road and said, who knew I was going to have to deal with this three, four, 17 years later? Well, God knew. But all of us, I think, will, will connect with one of these one of the best things of 2 Corinthians has here is trials and hope. It's an examination of the struggle and suffering, particularly through the life of Paul, but we can also relate to that and see how God can work through the trials and suffering of this life in a fallen world as we try to live lives that are faithful to him, to are obedient to him, and are, are serving him in this world. In the trials, we see that Paul will cling steadfastly to Jesus Christ and will not abandon his mission. He says, even though I am suffering, I have a purpose and I have a calling that is bigger than how I feel or bigger than my afflictions. And I will cling steadfastly. Because we also see that he expresses that Jesus is glorified even in our weakness. We may say at times, especially in our weakness. Because then it is obvious that the work is not because of our own strength, not because of our own cleverness, not because of our own resources, but because God was in it. And you know, we often today don't have a very good theology of suffering. We look in our culture for happy verses in the Bible. And, and I like those too. I like to feel happy. No one likes to go hear a sermon and say, well, you know, I was really happy when I came in and now I'm really upset. But sometimes that's what's best for me, right? When you go to the doctor's office, you want a good report. But you know what's even better than a good report? Is when the doctor says, you have a serious situation, but I'm so glad you're in. Because right now we can correct it. If you would have waited, this would have killed you. See, sometimes going to the doctor is scary. Sometimes it's intimidating. Sometimes it's uncomfortable and certainly unwanted. But the physician is there to restore us to health. And sometimes our suffering has a purpose. Pain has a purpose in the human body. It lets us know that something is wrong. And it's actually a, a very negative affliction for those people who cannot feel pain. They're very rare, but they can't feel pain with a touch. And they cause all sorts of damage to themselves. Because what was there is a protection. Isn't there to warn them that you're burning your hand on the burner or some other way they could get themselves into trouble. And so we, we in our life, I'm not saying we should be masochists or sadists or any of those things, but when we are hurt and we can stop and say, why, why is this happening? And even perhaps more importantly, what do you want to teach me out of this? See, I don't like pain. I, I pretty much detest it. Uh, I mean, it's funny when it happens to other people, but when it's me personally, I don't like it very much. But because I don't like it, I try to get through it more quickly if possible. Say, God, what do you want me to learn? Or what, do you want to, what work do you want to do through this? If I have to hurt anyways, let it not be wasted, but use it for your glory. So we, we're going to get a look at that. But the hope that comes out of this to see that God can use our afflictions for glory. We also get to see that growth is messy. It's, it's, it's one of the parts about being any sort of Christian leader that's really hard. Growth is messy. It's like raising your kids, right? If you have children, your house is not as clean as it was before you had children. When they get to a certain age, you can kind of have them as indentured servitude and just say, well, why do you think I had kids? It's because I needed someone to mow the lawn. I, mean, I heard that from my dad at least 35 times, that the only reason we had children is we didn't like doing chores. So get to work. Uh, but when they're really little, like Will, he's 18 months old. The kid's a mess. He is a mess. 17 months, almost 18 months. Lori's going, no, if you say 17 is close to 18, then yeah. But, and I do, because I'm a guy. We're going to deal with big round figures. But 
He, he's, he's a mess. What does he do? If something should not be touched, he will touch it. He will hide our remotes from us. It is like his game. He does. He just grabs it. He sees a remote. If I set down the mouse for my computer, he picks it up and runs off with it. That's the first thing that he does. He takes things that should be inside the house into our backyard. He takes the things that should be in our backyard and brings them into the house. The kid poops his diaper I don't know how many times a day. And that is very messy and very stinky, and no one wants to deal with it. But you know what? He's growing, and he's learning, and I have trust that he will not be doing these same things when he is 7 or 17 or 37. I hope. <laughs> it's like, is Will coming over for Thanksgiving? Hide the remotes. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, growth is messy, and it's true in a church, too. If we really want to be a ministering church, there will be messes. There will be. My, I have a ministry mentor who had his, his life ministry verse, Proverbs 14.4, and it reads, Where there are no oxen, the trough is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Like, I don't get it. If you don't have any animals, it's cleaner. But if you have an ox and you're a farmer your labor is greatly increased. He used to say this about the youth ministry. He basically thought we were a bunch of barnyard animals, and it's probably pretty close. But he said, look, when you have youth in a church, there will be messes and broken windows and behavior that just is not up to par yet. But when you have youth in a church, you'll have vitality and a future as well as a present. And the same thing's true about young believers. When you have someone coming to Christ, they're going to bring in a lot of bad habits. And some of you, you have bad habits as well. They're just more polite or hidden, right? But the truth is they will. And we have a classic story from Sunrise that predates me, right? One of your former associate pastors came to Christ and got invited to a potluck. And he said, great, I want to come hang out with other Christians. And he brought a case of beer to the potluck, which does not normally go over as well in Baptist circles. Everyone's just kind of like, well, um, we, we just don't really do that here. But yeah, some of you are like, why not? We'd have more people. But, uh, yeah, but the point being... Just, just probably not. Um, and he, he became this person who seemed like an unlikely Christian, let alone um, an unlikely pastor has gone on to walk with the Lord and be involved in ministry. But what would have happened if someone had said, oh, you don't belong here, you're too messy for us? The opportunity of growth that would have been missed. We don't condone sin. And that will become very clear in this book. We don't say it's okay to continue in sin. But all of us um, are still a work in progress. And so how do we balance these things? The Corinthian experience touches on that. Paul didn't say, I'm done. And man, that would have been tempting, wouldn't it? Because the other thing we're going to see in this book is restoration and obedience. Paul's heart, God's heart, is to restore this church to godliness, to himself personally, but mostly to a walk with the Lord. And like the parable of the lost sheep that Jesus told, he didn't say, you've wandered too far, you're a very stupid sheep, you deserve to be eaten. He said, no, I'm going to seek you out. I'm going to go and allow myself to be abused. And he was mad. He was mad. We, the angry letter is probably good that it wasn't in there because some of us as pastors would feel just a little bit too much uh, freedom to respond when we're feeling attacked. But he was upset, but he went back time and again for reconciliation, for restoration. And from the church's side, we also see that obedience is important to God, that we yield ourselves to his word. And we, and we should reflect on the words from scripture of, of through the prophet Samuel as God spoke to the disobedient king and he said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And this church had to learn, it doesn't matter whether you have people it doesn't matter whether you have resources. It doesn't matter whether you're happy. You need to obey God. You need to obey God. And they also needed to remember the words of Jesus Christ in John 14, verse 15, who said, if you love me, obey my commandments. But even as they were struggling with this concept of obedience, they weren't cast off beyond reclamation. But God was reconciling them to himself and reconciling them to their pastor, the Apostle Paul. 
And as we already talked at the very beginning of this book here, I'll read these verses again, because we've been doing a lot of background information again. And it's always, in my mind, it always feels a little bit of a waste if we're not actually reading out of God's Word um, directly. But Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, not the church who was of God or the church who will be of God, but how he views him, the church of God, which is in Corinth with all the saints who are in Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And what, what great words. If you can think of somebody that you had a huge fight with, somebody who has wronged you, and what does he pray for them? Grace and peace. Not, you guys were really wrong, and I'm glad you know it, and I had time to rub your nose in it. But I want you to experience the grace of God and have peace with him and with me. This is a normal greeting, but there's so much there that we could talk on for a long time. And certainly, if I could pray for you, if I would pray grace and peace for you, I think that would be a pretty okay prayer to receive, would it not? We're going to see the apostles' prayer, and we're going to see his heart. And we're going to see how we can walk um, in the middle of our suffering, because God is with us. Um, last, last week, we talked about Gideon and the lack of strength. In this book, we're going to see how Paul, at times, may not have felt like he was up, up for the task, but God's work was obvious in what he accomplished. There's, um, in this book here, um, the commentary I have by Scott um, Haifman, I just wanted to read quickly what he had to say about this book. He says, uh, 2 Corinthians is an apology for Paul's apostolic ministry, uh, and, but it is filled with challenges for the people of God in the 21st century. Paul's experience of God, his understanding of Christ, his authority as an apostle, and his willingness to suffer for the sake of the gospel because of his love for Christ's people, call into question the easy believism of our contemporary Christian culture. His gospel unmasks the cheap grace of today's repentantless forgiveness and also the legalism of those who remedy this problem by calling for more obedience to God and the complacency we feel over the spiritual condition of others. Paul's letter reveals that ministering Christ to others is not a matter of technique, program, and performance, but of mediating to others the same truth mercy and comfort we have experienced in trusting God, the same God who raises the dead. Look, we can come up with a better program. We can come up with a shinier method. But really, if, if our church and if any believer anywhere would want to be successful, they need to learn to walk in obedience to the power of God who will walk with them in their sufferings, who will walk with them in their successes and works to reconcile people to himself. We're going we're gonna to have the chance to see that in this series. It's going to be a great series. Um, and next week, we're going to jump full force into chapter one. So let's pray, and then we'll close in song. Lord, thank you so much for the background information on, on this church that you loved and you died for. And even when they were seemingly far away, you were still working. And God, we thank you for the the restoration that you did. But we also thank you for the restoration and the reconciliation that you are still doing. And we pray that you would help us to be the people we should be. We pray that you would help us to share the truth and mercy and the power of Jesus Christ with those who still need to hear it. And God, that though we are weak, your strength would be made evident and you would do a mighty work. Please teach us through this study and work in us through your own Holy Spirit wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen.